Well, uh, I would like very briefly to come back to Weber's theory of domination. <coughs> I deleted it from the questions, but I promise I will get this back in one way or another uh, for the next test. So probably the last thing you want to think about now is a test. <laughs> Uh, but let me still talk about uh, the theory of domination. I think it's a very important theory, extremely influential and extremely insightful. So uh, let me just very briefly sum up where we left it last time, and then I move into Weber's theory of traditional authority. And uh, last time we were talking about the crucial distinction Weber makes between Macht and Herrschaft. Uh, Macht is translated in English as power. There is no um, question about this. Uh, the translation of Herrschaft varies. Uh, it is uh, translated either as authority uh, or it is translated as domination. Um, and I think most translations uh, are good. Um, I think uh, people um, uh, whom I feel closer in my own Weber reading, uh, translated it more like domination rather than authority. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, just to emphasize you the uh, importance of the uh, uh, translational difference uh, in the notion of Herrschaft, the first uh, four letters, Herr, uh, means the Lord. So I think the notion of Herrschaft uh, uh, has a very strong implications of asymmetrical power relationships, uh, but I think domination captures better than authority. Those who translated Weber's notion of Herrschaft as authority, like uh, Talcott Parsons, wanted to emphasize that Weber um, uh, 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 looks uh, at Herrschaft uh, as something which is authoritarian, right? Where somebody acts out of authority, right? Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, not a false translation, but misses an important point, uh, namely Weber's interest uh, in the way how power is being exercised. Uh, in fact, it in a way misses uh, Max Weber's roots in uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, or probably even I may dare so in Hobbes, uh, right? Human history is all about the history of struggle for power. That's, in my reading, uh, Weber's fundamental idea. Power with an important modification, and I gave you the citation uh, last lecture, but let me come back to this. Uh, power means the likelihood that people will uh, obey order uh, even against resistance. And domination means the likelihood that people will actually follow orders without being coerced to do so. Uh, so the notion uh, of domination or herrschaft does imply a degree of voluntariness, a minimum level of belief uh, that in fact those who issue order do have the right to do so, or at, is, at least it is reasonable that they issue orders and I follow the orders. Or to come up with an even more minimal definition of uh, Herrschaft that I cannot see any real alternative under the present circumstances but to obey the orders to the one who issues these orders, right? Uh, so, uh, and this has everything to do with the idea of legitimacy. And I put uh, uh, at last lecture this little equation, right, uh, uh, on one of the slides uh, that power uh, plus legitimation adds up uh, to domination uh, or authority. So what is legitimation? Weber said power is really an extreme case. That very little, very, uh, it, it happens very rarely 
uh, that the one who exercises authority exercises simply by exerting power, coercing people to obey. Uh, those who are in position of authority uh, uh, try to legitimate uh, their auto uh, authority and try to come up with reasons why people subjected to this authority should uh, obey their authority. It's again very Nietzschean, the idea, right? That those who are exercising power tries to internalize your subjugation to power in one way or another and try to create in you, in you a morality, right? A set of principles by which you would say, well, uh, this probably may be the right thing for me to do. Or, as I said, the minimum definition, even if you don't particularly like obeying order, you say, what else can I do? The alternative, if I don't obey order, would be worse. Uh, or about the person who issues authority. You may not like the person who issues authority, but you will say, but the alternative is worse, right? So you can pick a course. You may not like the lecturer all that much or the way how it grades, but there were other courses you did shop for and they were even worse. So you pick the least worse course, right? You pick the lecturer who seems to be the least boring and who seems to be the most reasonable grading your assignment, right? That doesn't mean that you are all that thrilled to be at lectures and to do assignments, but you have to do it, and under the circumstances, you go for the less evil, right? That's, I think, the kind of most extreme interpretation of Weber's idea of legitimacy. But Weber also, I pointed this word out to you. Weber said that all legitimacy contains an element of a myth. It doesn't mean that the person who tries to justify its authority is telling the truth. Whether it is truth or not truth, it's almost besides the point. The most important issue is that it creates a mythology about the reason why you have to obey authority. So what I've tried to underline already in last lecture, that Weber's notion of legitimacy is so much more sophisticated, so less liberal, and so much more Nietzschean than the idea we normally hear when you hear the word legitimation. By legitimation, we see something very good, right? A power is legitimated because it was somebody was elected in fair and free elections uh, to an office and we believe that this person will do a great job having been elected. Well, a Weber would be more likely to think something like Karzai. Well, uh, under the circumstances, probably there is no alternative to Afghanistan but to have this guy as the president, though it's very doubtful, you know, what all those claims about the legitimacy of the system are being made, they are pretty much a mythology created around it. Uh, but uh, otherwise, the alternative is chaos, and even this guy is probably better than chaos, which would happen otherwise. Now, this is uh, in my dark reading of Max Weber. Now, as you can see, of course, the difference from Marx is fundamental. Uh, Marx did see human history as unfolding of modes of production. It was all struggle around ownership and means of production, clash of economic interest. For Weber, it is not economic interest which drives human history, but struggle for power. And he can describe different systems of authority over time, but it is all described uh, on the quality and the nature of those mythologies 
those in position of power come up with to legitimate what they are trying to do to you. Right? Uh, so that is one fundamental difference between uh, Marx and Weber. There is another fundamental difference, and uh, you will have to uh, uh, bear this very much in mind as this lecture on traditional authority unfolds. Though Weber develops these different types of uh, domination, uh, primarily to describe historical change, grand societies, traditional authority, charismatic authority, legal rational authority, kind of describes the evolution of humankind and has a similar kind of flavor than Marx uh, subsequent modes of production. But Weber does more than that. These three types of authority do describe all kind of organizations or social units. Uh, um, today we can talk about legal rational authority, traditional authority or charismatic authority in contemporary society. Though he would call liberal market capitalism as the purest type, and what pure type is, I will talk about this in a minute, of legal rational authority, he will say that even in contemporary society, we have organizations which are based on traditional authority. The most obvious example of traditional authority, and bear it in mind when we will be talking about this uh, uh, today, is the family you live in. Right? The family is primarily bound together by tradition. But the very institution where you are in now, universities, do have a flavor of traditional authority. Right? Uh, it has a kind of ethos, or at least we teachers believe that you have to pay some respect to the teachers. And we have all kind of traditional rituals right, which makes uh, uh, the making, uh, the functioning of a university uh, in a way a traditional organization, right. There is the graduation ceremony when you will be wearing all this funny, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, academic dress. And then you are awarded a degree which is happening almost like uh, awarding uh, um, a lordship by the queen, right? The president will say, by the power invested in me, uh, and then by this power will confer to you, right, the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Sciences, right? Uh, this very much uh, like conferring the title of lordship uh, on somebody by the queen of England, by the powers vested in her. Uh, okay, so therefore Weber is more flexible with Marx. It not, doesn't simply describe society, but in every society it does describe uh, uh, certain organizations. And in contemporary society we often talk about charisma. And we have been talking a lot about charisma in the last 18 months when we were talking about uh, 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 Barack Obama, and Barack Obama being a charismatic leader, right? So the charisma is also um, something what we very often invoke today, um, uh, describing uh, the nature of authority uh, somebody um, is uh, exercising. Okay, so that <clears throat> that's again, you know, just the backdrop uh, to the notion of authority, and I hope it will help you to locate it uh, more uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, literature. Now, as I mentioned also in last uh, lecture, there are three major types of authority. Traditional authority in which basically the, you have a personal master in charge, and this personal master somehow appeals to old uh, age-old uh, 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 sacred rules uh, 
uh, to ask you to obey his or her commands, mostly his, but occasionally her commands. After all, there is a queen in England, and there were queens in England for a long time. Okay, uh, so that's traditional authority. Uh, the other one is charismatic authority, where the person in charge um, uh, calls for obedience on the grounds uh, uh, that uh, that person is believed to have some supernatural, extraordinary powers. Uh, um, uh, 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 and finally, legal rational authority, authority in which uh, the person who is uh, um, uh, issuing command is also under the same law as people who are obeying orders and in legal rational authority you do not have a personal master, you do not obey a person, but you obey the rules and laws. That's why Weber calls it legal rational authority as a shorthand. I think it would be more obvious to call it liberal authority or liberal system of authority. I just want to make one more, one very brief comment um, as we proceed uh, to traditional authority, namely that the three types of authorities are not exactly of the same uh, ontological status. Uh, Weber basically have two major types of authority, traditional authority or legal rational authority. Charismatic authority does not have the longevity of a traditional authority or legal rational authority has. Charismatic authority, as we will talk about this a great deal, is a revolutionary force. Charismatic authority usually occurs for a relatively brief period of time. Typically, the charismatic leader is a one person and it is very lucky if that one person can maintain the charisma for all the time this person is in charge. I mean, uh, just after nine months uh, of the election of President Obama, we see a little, right, withering of his sort of strong charismatic appeal. So in order to maintain your charisma for, while you are in office, and especially for a lifetime, is very difficult. And even more difficult to transfer charisma to another leader. So charismatic authority is really a change, basically, as I will argue later on, from one form of traditional authority to another form of traditional authority in Max Weber. So therefore, really, the two big types, traditional authority and legal, rational authority, and what Marx called the transition from feudalism to capitalism, or what we understand modernization is really nothing else but the movement from traditional authority to legal rational authority. Okay? Uh, now let me go, go uh, into today's topic uh, um, and uh, talk about traditional authority. And uh, uh, first about pure type. I will describe his definition of the pure type but it needs uh, uh, a footnote what pure type is all about. <coughs> uh, uh, as I already pointed out, Max Weber was a Kantian. Uh, that meant that Max Weber did not believe uh, uh, that hu uh, human knowledge which completely describes the reality is possible, right? The reality is so infinitely rich that the concepts what we develop is only mental images of this object, what we are developing concept about, right? It can be never be fully describing the subject. So these mental objects, what we have in our mind about the object from which we try to develop knowledge is what he calls uh, ideal types. Uh, they are abstractions from the world, not a precise description of the world. Uh, so therefore, what he said, the best what we can aim at to develop ideal type, pure types, and all realities will be always somewhat different 
from the ideal type what is in our mind. And as human knowledge is progressing, and that's what makes actually Weber a difficult reading, is that in the process of knowledge, we develop an ideal type, a conceptions about the world. And then we go back to reality and we see that it does not exhaust the reality as it is. The reality has other important features we missed in the first instance. So we go back and we redo our ideal type, enrich the ideal type to fit, to create a better fit with reality. Right? That's the fundamental idea. And that's what makes Weber so difficult to read because he often comes up with an ideal type, a pure type, and he said, yes, but when I'm reading at historical reality, it does not quite fit, so therefore I redo a little my ideal type and enrich it. So you, you can easily get lost when you are reading Weber, and this is not accidental. Right? This is the methodology how he proceeds. He does not believe that we can attain absolute knowledge. Uh, but, 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 but he believes that we have to strive to be able to describe what we want to describe as precisely as we just can, as we can. So this is the idea of pure types. So what is the pure type of legal rational authority, uh, of uh, traditional authority? And first of all, we have to talk about the basis of legitimacy. Uh, uh, just very briefly, something also about the patterns, how a staff is being recruited as such. <clears throat> and here we come with a very clear and simple de definition. Uh, in traditional authority, legitimacy is claimed for and believed in by virtue of the sanctity of age-old rules. So the person uh, who rules uh, makes a claim that this has been always this way and there is some sacredness in, in fact, obeying the person who by age-old tradition was assigned uh, to a position of authority. <clears throat> Again, let me just go back to the family. This is a classical example. The parents uh, do uh, uh, have some sacred ri rights to issue some commands, and we do obey parents because it has always this way. Children always had to obey parents. To what extent they have to obey and what parents can do to children may vary a little over time, but that parents are in charge and they are, um, uh, uh, um, uh, in fact, to have the rights to issue certain kind of commands is widely accepted. But the word believed in is also very important, right? So the parents uh, do not have to force you to obey. You're beginning to believe that if it is indeed right thing that the parents obey order. It happens also if you particularly dislike what they try to order, and occasionally you may not like uh, uh, one of your parents or both of your parents. Nevertheless, you think some degree of obedience uh, is necessary unless you really break the law and you run away, right? Um, but that is uh, uh, certainly um, an extreme case. As it is an extreme case that parents will force children, uh, use coercion uh, of children to obey their rule. Well, uh, occasionally they use some degree of coercion. It's also very important in, in Weber, you know, that coercion is always present in every type of domination. Do not think that legal rational authority does not have coercion. In the United States, over three million people are in jail, right? They are being coerced. In the United States, people occasionally are killed by the government, right? They are executed. So there is coercion even in legal rational authority in the most liberal democratic society. If you break the laws, you will be coerced. And if you are not breaking the law, there is always the promise of coercion, right? It said, well, under certain circumstances, you will be coerced. Um, now, the, 
second important point is, right, that the master who obeys the order is designated by traditional rule, right, and they are obeyed because of their Eigenwürde. Um, well, Eigenwürde is translated into English as traditional status. Uh, it's not a very good translation. Eigenwürde really means that they are believed to have virtues by themselves, that they have a virtue what they themselves carry out. So there is honor. Uh, I think the term honor is extremely important, right, um, uh, uh, for understanding traditional authority. Uh, the traditional master is always assumed to be an honorable person, right? And if that person becomes non-honorable, it is likely that it will use its authority. Again, think about parents, right? Um, the parents are supposed to be honorable, and if they are not honorable any longer, there is a crisis in the family. Um, have you seen Arthur Miller's play, The Death of the Salesman? This is exactly what happens in The Death of the Salesman. When his son catches the father whom he admired so much, he's catching him uh, with uh, uh, another woman than uh, his mother, right? Then suddenly the father loses his honor. He's not honorable any longer, right? And that creates a lifelong crisis for the child. So um, uh, I think honor is very important to understand traditional authority. And uh, uh, it is based, uh, a traditional rule is based on personal loyalty. You personally feel that you have to be loyal uh, to this person. Again, all of these issues do apply to a substantial degree in institutions like a university, right? <clears throat> uh, uh, it is also the kind of assumed, right, uh, that, you know, professors should act in an honorable way. And if they don't, uh, they are caught of being not honorable, they are, will be losing their uh, 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 legitimacy. And there is a great deal of personal loyalty uh, in university situations. Well, particularly in graduate school, the relationship, the mentor and the PhD student is a highly personalized relationship of mutual loyalties. Uh, right? Uh, um, there is so much a mentor will be able to take that a PhD student in the dissertation will be too critical of the professor who is supervising the dissertation. It accepts some degree of loyalty right from the student. And the student would be very disappointed and if it turns out that the mentor is writing bad letters for him, right? There is an expectation, right, of mutual loyalty in every type of traditional authority. <clears throat> uh, and what is therefore important, there is also a personal element whom you obey is a kind of a personal master, not simply a supervisor, not a boss, but something of a personal most master, an honorable person to whom you are linked to uh, by uh, 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 loyalty. Well, how do you recruit staff under this uh, 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 system? There are really two ways to do it. There is a so-called patrimonial recruitment, um, uh, namely that people are selected into position uh, because they are related to the chief uh, uh, by tradition, uh, because they are known to the chief. Um, uh, this happens to a great deal in various organizations even today, um, especially university organizations do exercise a substantial uh, patrimonial system of recruitment, but there are extra patrimonial ways when persons uh, uh, are judged to be loyal by the master and are appointed to the office because of, of their expected loyalty as such. Again, I can give you the example of the universities where a lot of recruitment is happening through patrimonial recruitment. Uh, you are, well, in the U.S. universities you are not supposed to recruit your own students. In Europe they do. Uh, uh, in the U.S. few universities do. 
but you recruit uh, the students of your bodies or your, your friends or your colleagues, right? There's a lot of patrimonialism going on in university uh, recruitment. And in, the, in fact, loyalty is very important when it comes particularly to the appointment of administrators in the university system. Uh, well, there are, uh, let me move on and uh, let's have the broader historical view. There are various historical variations uh, of traditional authority. <coughs> uh, Weber is very messy in terms of terminology. I was trying to make uh, as much sense as I could. I think there are two major forms of traditional authority. One is called patriarchalism and the other one is called patrimonial domination. The big difference between patriarchal systems that it does not have a staff, um, uh, that uh, what is being, the authority is exercised directly by the master and does not need a staff in order to exercise its authority. Patrimonial uh, domination, on the other hand, does have a staff. It is a larger scale society or a larger scale organization where a staff will carry out the commands of the master. This is the distinction between master, staff, and the people who obey is extremely important for Max Weber and try to get deep down in your brain this comment because the, you cannot understand Weber without this. As I pointed out, Weber said there is always a degree of belief or faith involved in legitimacy. But what kind of faith depends a great deal whether the faith is by the staff in the master or by the people in the master. Weber's fundamental idea is that the system is legitimate as long as the staff has a positive belief in the master. Uh, the masses, the people, usually do not have a positive belief. They don't usually love the person who rules them. They just accept it as the lesser evil. But the staff has to have a positive belief in the master. When do come, revolution comes? When the staff is losing faith in the master. When the Shah of Iran fell? When the security services in Iran began to lose faith in the Shah. The people of Iran usually did not like the Shah all that much. They just could not think of an alternative, so they accepted it. But the regime fell when the security services lost faith in them. The same can go for the fall of communism. Communism fell when the Communist Party staff and especially the secret services began to lose faith in the system. Not that most people who lived under communism were all that bloody communists, right? But, well, the staff was. When the staff turned out to be again communism, that's when communism fell. Well, patriarchalism, I will make two dif distinctions here, primary patriarchalism and gerontocracy, and then about patrimonial domination, about pure patrimonialism, where the staff is purely a personal instrument in the master, and finally, a state type of domination of what we normally call feudalism, uh, when the administrative staff actually appropriates certain powers from the master. Uh, and now what I do you to show, I think, what Weber's theory of history is, how these different types of uh, systems evolve. He said that history begins with patriarchalism, so relatively small societies, for instance, kinship networks where the elders or the father can rule the society and does not need policemen, jailers, you know, judges, uh, administrators, tax collectors in order to run the staff. It does it directly. Uh, then it moves to a primary patrimonialism where the society becomes larger. Uh, there is staff, but the staff is individually selected by the master and they, they completely depend by the master. <coughs> the most extreme example of this is, as I will uh, talk about this in a minute, sultanism, where the sultan can actually uh, get rid and typically get shreds of the staff uh, 
at will and very frequently. <coughs> then it is moving to feudal type of nomination, where the staff appropriates certain powers from the master, appropriates those powers because, uh, um, for instance, it has land holding, what is given to a noble family, not only for life, but also for the family, for the life of the family, right? Uh, the feudal uh, property has been inherited. And then the staff appropriates certain powers uh, from uh, the master, will act as a master, for instance, even serve justice. And finally, legal rational authority, uh, where uh, the power of coercion is the monopoly of the state. No individual has the right to exercise coercive power except the state. Well, this is not quite true. Parents, for instance, still uh, have some right. We, ha we feel uncomfortable about this, but parents do have some rights to exercise coercion. But generally, you cannot exercise any coercion, only the state can. So as you can see, in a way, the history of humankind is an evolution of the means of coercion. Why for Marx the question was the evolution of the means of production. For Weber, history is driven by the evolution of the means of administration and coercion. Again, a very Nietzschean idea. Uh, that dark read of uh, the history, that history actually is getting worse because those who rule have more and more sophisticated means to suppress a larger number of people, and what makes it even worse, they internalize, you internalize your own submission internally. You believe that this is the right thing, that you are not free, right? That's again, I think, the Weberian view of history in my reading. Now about patriarchalism is the most elementary form, as I said. Um, uh, um, when uh, we believe, right, that there is one master without a staff uh, who has uh, the right to exercise orders, uh, because that it, it is no staff, uh, it is uh, um, assumed that the members uh, of the group uh, which is under patriarchalism, for instance, a kinship networks, um, uh, has a, a, a substantial uh, uh, feeling uh, that they actually should obey. Uh, this master, uh, Weber calls them, they are genossen, they are comrades, there is a camaraderie, right? This is a family, right? The family has some degree of warmness. They are not, uh, uh, he said, untertanen, they are not subjects to authority, but they are comrades, right? They are members of a community. Um, uh, primary patriarchalism uh, means when there is uh, 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 typically a, a, a father uh, uh, kind of rule. Uh, the father rules, typically it's a, there, are, there may have been maternal authority as well. Uh, the historical record is a bit unclear whether there were matriarchal societies. Uh, we can assume there were, so then they have were patriarchal, matriarchal societies. It was a mother who ruled the family or a father who ruled the family. And uh, uh, the relationships were not necessarily based on blood relationship because actually for a very long time we did not know uh, that the sexual act may have uh, all that much to do with procreation. It, a, reason, a reasonably recent discovery of human scientific knowledge that this happened. And therefore in very early societies it was not known uh, that there is blood relationship between the father and the children. Um, uh, even then uh, it did hold. Uh, uh, well, one subcase is of course slavery. I, I leave it out, but let me talk about gerontocracy. There are some systems in which uh, the elders rule, the older person has uh, uh, the authority. Um, uh, well, gerontocracy is again something which is not unheard of from modern societies as well. Now let me move on to patrimonial domination. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, does emerge, uh, typically emerge when an administrative staff is being created. This is a larger societies 
you need armies and policemen and tax collectors in order to uh, operate, and the members who are subordinated to your authority are treated as subjects. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm also Her Majesty's subject, uh, you know, when I got once uh, Australian citizenship, and then, uh, um, you know, uh, the Queen is still the Queen of uh, Australia, so I'm Her Majesty's subject, not simply an Australian citizen, right? Uh, when there is a person with whom um, the authority is relied on in some ways in England and in Australia, this is the figure of the Queen who does that, right? Uh, uh, well, uh, I don't want to deal with this because I'm running out of time, right? Uh, uh, initially, uh, patriarchal domination, pa patrimonial domination was really just a large household. And in fact, uh, what the you know, ruler, the king or emperor did, he went from one village to the next and with his staff and was fed for like uh, in a household and moved on. But then, of course, uh, it became more complex uh, and then uh, uh, had to create uh, um, a state. Uh, had to create a state in which uh, uh, moves beyond the oikos uh, um, uh, where taxes are being collected um, 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 and it's running a, in a, with, a, with a kind of a, a, a bureaucracy. Um, now, uh, in a pure type of patrimonial domination, right, uh, uh, the uh, staff are purely uh, uh, instruments in the hands of the master. And like uh, I mentioned, sultanism is where there is virtually unrestrained uh, power for uh, the ruler to replace uh, uh, those under its uh, authority as it pleases. But then uh, uh, evolves in history a more complex system, um, a state type of domination or feudalism. Uh, it is a system um, in which uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, calls it a state type of domination um, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, the staff has certain degree of uh, stability. Um, uh, 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 now, how much stability uh, it has, uh, um, uh, it will depend uh, how the staff is being uh, rewarded. And uh, Weber makes uh, a crucial distinction between benefices and thieves. Uh, these are the two ways how the staff uh, uh, can be um, rewarded um, in uh, an estate type of domination. A thief, uh, uh, you will easily remember that, right? Uh, we use the term in ordinary language. We say somebody has a thiefdom. And by this we mean if somebody has a thiefdom, it means that somebody created a, a subsystem over which it has control uh, virtually as long as that position is alive or as, as that position is at least uh, in the same organization. Uh, <clears throat> so if, again, if I can use the university examples, you may not be as familiar with this as I am, but in universities, for instance, uh, office space for faculty is a typical fiefdom. Uh, once, uh, you know, in faculty got an office, it's virtually impossible to take that office away from somebody. It created a fiefdom uh, over uh, the territory uh, what, that, uh, what that person has. Well, this is uh, uh, only for the time of the tenure. Of course, somebody retires, their office will be immediately taken away. The fiefdom is lost. But, you know, the notion of fiefdom means that you have lasting power on it. Benefice, on the other hand, means that you get certain rewards, uh, but only under the conditions that you actually do deliver uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to the ruler. And there are uh, really two types of feudal uh, 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 systems. Uh, one is uh, uh, based uh, 
um, on uh, benefices, uh, um, and this is a, a kind of a prebendo for form of feudalism. That means uh, uh, the nobility who is serving the Tsar, for instance, Russia, was ruled uh, typically uh, after Ivan the Terrible, my namesake, uh, and until uh, uh, the Russian Revolution by a kind of prebendal system um, in which uh, the Tsar uh, uh, gave uh, 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 estate uh, to the lords as long as they were loyal to it. Uh, uh, we see this now happening in Russia again. Um, President Putin actually took uh, the billions of dollars of wealth uh, uh, what people received uh, from President Yeltsin as private property because he did not think they are loyal. So these people ended up in jail or they were sent into emigration. Their property was taken away. Uh, so even contemporary Russia, in a way, operates almost like a Brebendor type of feudalism, right? Uh, President Putin is a kind of Ivan the Terrible, right, who sort of reinforces loyalty. Uh, uh, and uh, I made uh, the point, right? That was exactly as in Russia changed uh, uh, the uh, feudal system, um, and uh, when uh, uh, boyars uh, uh, were turned into pomeshchiks. Boyars in Russia be before um, Ivan the Terrible had inherited wealth, um, and Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great took that away and turned them into serving nobility uh, in exchange for loyalty. Uh, if you have uh, listened to Mussorgsky's fantastic opera, Boris Godunov, you get the story there, exactly. If you have not listened to it, do, right? Don't get a Yale degree not having known Bo uh, 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 Mussorgsky's fantastic opera, uh, Boris Godunov, uh, right? Uh, well, uh, Western feudalism, on the other hand, is based uh, uh, on... Uh, 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 long-lasting uh, powers uh, of the staff. Uh, uh, Western feudal lords uh, received the property for a lifetime and it actually was inherited uh, by uh, their uh, uh, children. Uh, and in fact, they also exercised a great deal of administrative power, right? Uh, uh, feudal lords in France or England did held court and made judgments, right, over their, their serfs, those who belonged to their authority. So they, uh, and the, the kings were rather limited in their power. Uh, well, we have seen this struggle earlier in this course, right? Uh, between uh, the kings trying to gain more of authority, take it back from their feudal lords. Uh, that's all what uh, uh, absolutism versus constitutional monarchy was all about, right? Well, of course, for uh, constitutional monarchy was not simply um, uh, the uh, feudal lords uh, uh, who resisted, but also already the bourgeoisie who wanted to have a, a constitutional monarchy to limit uh, 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 the rights uh, of the monarch. Well, uh, traditional authority, authority, does, uh, authority doesn't go very well with the economy, right? Because it is primarily oriented towards satisfaction of needs and not generation of the profit, uh, right? And uh, uh, therefore, um, uh, traditional domination is likely to prevent the development of business-oriented activities. And that's, I think, again true for the more traditional type of system, what we are familiar with, like the family or the universities, uh, that they do not quite operate like business corporations, uh, uh, and uh, therefore they uh, 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 May, uh, uh, make uh, 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 calcu economic calculation and profit seeking uh, difficult or impossible. Um, uh, they can be a defense against market, me market mechanism, but do not prom promote uh, mar market mechanism. Uh, well, um, uh, and of course, in all of these organizations, there is a larger degree of arbitrariness 
than in modern uh, organizations. Uh, 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 and of course, uh, in traditional organization, there is always a greater uh, um, respect to the welfare of those who are subjugated to authority. So that's about traditional authority and its tension with modern capitalism. Thank you.